Leviticus chapter 25. We're going to look at the Sabbath of the seventh year in this chapter. Then we're going to study the year of Jubilee. Find out what that's all about. We're going to see uh, the redemption of property in Israel. How to respond when our brothers and sisters, I should say when how, how God wanted Israel to respond with their brothers and sisters uh, were poor and were in need. And we're going to look at the laws concerning slavery in this chapter as well. Let's look at verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Now, remember, they're still at Sinai. Now, they've been there a long time since way back in the first part of the book of Exodus. So we've been looking at them for quite some time here at at Mount Sinai. However, uh, the law that God was about to give would apply to them when they get into the promised land. Look at verse 2. He says to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Every seven years was a year of rest for the land. I guess this is scientifically smart. But it was also given to keep Israel from coveting. The breaking of this law which Israel did, by the way. They broke this law. Oh, and they broke it a lot. It's one of the sins that sent that nation into Babylonian captivity. We'll read about that when we get to Second Chronicles chapter 36. Look at what God says in verse 3. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year, There shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. God knows everything that there is to know about farming. And, you know, in years past, some southern United States land became unproductive because they planted cotton year after year after year without giving the land rest. And, you know, it didn't produce anything then. God knew what he was talking about here. He knows that the land needs rest. So he says, one out of every seven years, you let that land rest. Verse 5, he says, what grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for your, for you and your male and female servants, your hired man and the stranger who dwells with you, for your livestock and the beasts that are in your land. All its produce shall be food, shall be for food. God didn't let the people and the animals starve every seven years, you know. He took care of them. In fact, the land was so blessed that it didn't have to be planted each year. That was God's plan. The crops would grow automatically on that seventh year. They were not to be harvested for market. Instead, they were to be eaten They were to be eaten by the owner of the land and they were to be eaten by his servants and by the poor and by the animals. They just were not to be harvested and and sold in the marketplace. Every one out of every seven years that was to be the case. See, this this would really keep them from coveting, keep them from being greedy in addition to giving the land a rest. Were they going to trust God for that seventh year? For the provisions, or would they break the law, you know, just to make extra bucks? You know, it's like I remember when I was a 
a, a kid. I mean, I'm you know I'm talking six, seven years old. In our town, stores were not open on Sunday. They I mean, they weren't. There were no Kmart's or or Walmart's or any of these type places. Uh, you know, there were dime stores downtown and grocery stores, and, but they were not open on Sunday. Not even a grocery store was open on Sunday. People, people took seriously the Sabbath day rest, and even it wasn't even though it wasn't the Sabbath day, they lived by the principle, and they gave up the earnings for that day to live by that principle. It was just something as natural as could be. Well, that's not the case anymore. Now, you're lucky if the place is closed down on Sunday or on on Christmas or on Easter. Look at verse 8. And by the way, I remember Good Fridays too. Stores used to be closed from noon until 3 in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Look at the year of Jubilee here. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be for you to you forty-nine years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. Verse 10 says, And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. The year of jubilee, what a great idea. And God could do it because it's his country and it all belonged to him. Now watch this. People could mortgage their land if they got in trouble financially. But in the Jubilee, the year of Jubilee it was called, in the 50th year, all land returned to its original owner, even if during that 50-year period he mortgaged it because he needed the money. It would go back to him on the 50th year. Also, if a man was sold into indentured slavery, he was set free on year number 50. The year of Jubilee, in addition to being a, a great idea for the, for the people back in those days, it also has some symbolic value. The year of Jubilee was a type of this age of grace, the church age. That's because today the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ is preached to people who are slaves of sin and slaves of Satan. And it is the year of Jubilee, spiritually speaking. This whole church age is because because when somebody responds to the gospel and repents of their sin and asks Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, they are set free. They have they are, they are given liberty. Liberty and freedom. Liberty from the power of the devil and liberty from the power of sin. They are no longer slaves to this world. And they are no longer slaves to their flesh or to the devil. Their enemies have been defeated. They have been redeemed out of slavery. And they have been set free by the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is really a year of jubilee. And it has been for 2,000 years. Jesus even said when he came on the scene, I believe it was in the Gospel of Luke, he said, I have come to proclaim liberty to the captives. And he was talking about the year of Jubilee. It was fulfilled. That Jubilee celebration, that year in God's law in the Old Testament was a picture, a prophetic picture of the church age. It was a type of the church age. Verse 11. That fiftieth year shall be a Jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. Remember, this jubilee year followed the Sabbath year. So you know what that means? That means that for two years, 
the land wouldn't be planted or harvested. Two years. The people would have to trust God to meet their needs because they neither planted nor harvested for two whole years. Hey, that's a nice vacation, isn't it? Hey, I would love it. I would love it if God said, Hey, every seven years you take off, Mike. You take off an entire year. That would be fantastic. And you just spend that time seeking me, God, or seeking me, Mike, and and, and don't worry about anything because I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to meet all of your needs, and I'm commanding you to take every seventh year off. And don't go to work, and just look to me and have a good time of fellowship with me. Boy, that would be great. I'd love it. Verse 13. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor. And according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price. And according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price. For he sells to you according to the number of the years of the crops. Verse 17 says, Therefore you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. When it was necessary to sell your land, the price was to be carefully computed on the basis of how many harvests, how many harvests there were left until the next jubilee. And then that's what the price of the land was to be sold for. Verse 18 says, So you shall observe my statutes and keep my judgments and perform them, and you will dwell in this land in safety. Then the land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell there in safety. And if you say, What shall we eat in the seventh year, since we shall not sow nor gather in our produce? Then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, and it will bring forth produce enough for three years, and you shall sow in the eighth year, and eat old produce until the ninth year, until its produce comes in. You shall eat of the old harvest. Keeping the Sabbath of years... And the year of Jubilee, as I mentioned, was an act of faith because there was no sowing and there was no harvesting. A person had to believe that God would meet all of their needs as he promised he would. God says, if you believe me, I'll protect you from starvation and I'll protect you from war. In other words, God is saying, obey me, and I'll take care of you. All you have to do is worry about walking with me. I'll take care of all the details of your life. Oh, that's a principle that holds true for today. You say you don't know what to do. You say you're in a tough spot. You say your future looks mighty dim. You know, maybe just maybe God is trying to teach you something. Maybe He's trying to teach you to just seek Him and walk with Him moment by moment, second by second, in fellowship with Him, and just trust Him to take care of the details in your life. You know, as you walk with Him, He's going to make everything uh, okay. He's going to take care of you. If you walk in obedience and in fellowship with Him, doing what He wants you to do, He's going to make sure that you're taken care of, and He's going to make sure that everything that happens to you will work out for your good to conform you into the image of Christ. Now look at verse 23. The land shall not be sold permanently for the land is mine. We're going to look at the redemption of property beginning in verse 23. The land shall not be sold permanently for the land is mine for you are strangers and sojourners with me And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. 
the Israeli government didn't own the land didn't belong to the army didn't belong to the priests didn't belong to the government the people didn't own the land God Almighty owned that land and he allotted a portion of it to each tribe and each family and he wanted it to stay in each family the very family that he gave a portion of land to that land was to remain in that particular family that's why the year of jubilee was established so that the land at every 50 years would revert back to the original owner if it had been sold but the land belonged to God they were just squatters you know they were just renters that's all tenants look at verse 25 if one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it then he may redeem what his brother sold or if the man has no one to redeem it but he himself becomes able to redeem it then let him count the years since its sale and restore the re the remainder to the man to whom he sold it that he may return to his possession but if he is not able to have it restored to himself then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of jubilee and in the jubilee it shall be released and he shall return to his possession if an Israelite falls into hard financial times and is therefore forced to sell a portion of his land a near relative could redeem it uh, the word redeem biblical term means buy it back for him or if he has no near relative to buy it you know maybe in the future he'll have the means to buy it back he'll have the the means in other words to redeem it for himself to buy it back for himself if that's not an option if neither one of those things are an option it'll still be returned to him in the year of jubilee you just have to wait a little bit longer that's all verse 29 if a man sells a house in a walled city then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold within a full year he may redeem it but if it is not redeemed within the space of a full year then the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it throughout his generations it shall not be released in the jubilee however the houses of villages which have no wall around them shall be counted as the fields of the country they may be redeemed and they shall be released in the jubilee nevertheless the cities of the levites and the houses in the cities of their possession the levites may redeem at any time and if a man purchases a house from the levites then the house that was sold in the city of his possession shall be released in the jubilee for the houses of the cities of the levites are their possession among the children of israel but the field of the common land of their cities may not be sold for it is their perpetual possession there were two exceptions in the redemption of property number one if a house in a walled city was sold it was not returned in the year of jubilee and also a person who sold their house in a walled city had one year to redeem it to buy it back afterwards it became the permanent property of the buyer that's the first exception in the redemption of property a walled city a house inside of a walled city a fortified city was sold that could not be returned 
it was not returned in the year of Jubilee. If the guy wanted it back, he had to buy it back, and he had a year to do so, otherwise he lost it forever. So that's the first exception. The second exception with regards to the redemption of property was this. Levites always had the right to redeem their property. And if they didn't, it always returned to them in the year of Jubilee. So they could sell a house and, and they could buy it back any time they wanted to, any time they had the means to do so. Verse 35. Let's look at what God says about lending to the poor. If one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. God is a God of compassion. God is a, a God of decency. He's not some cold, uncaring deity trillions of miles away someplace in outer space, a place called heaven, who's so busy that he doesn't have time to think about those who have needs, special needs. He's involved and he cares in his law, as we have seen throughout the book of Leviticus and Exodus for that matter, is designed to be concerned about the needy. And many of his laws reflect this. He's a God of decency. And this is reflected in his law concerning helping a poor person right here. God says, be generous to somebody who's who has a need. You know? Don't be greedy. Don't take advantage of their hard times by trying to make a profit from them. You know, if your if your brother or your sister needs money, don't give them a loan and charge them eighteen percent interest. Don't charge them any interest. Help them out because he needs help. Verse thirty nine. And if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers." For they are my servants, whom I brought up out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your God. You know, the Bible says you can't serve two masters. You either serve God, or you serve someone or something else. But you can't serve two masters. And God says, the Israelites are my slaves. I bought them. I got them out of Egypt. They belong to me. So don't you let those Israelites become slaves to other Israelites or to anybody else. Not permanently anyway. They could sell themselves to pay off a debt. We've seen that. But you know, they were not to be thought of as slaves of somebody else. Personal property. Chattel of some other human being because they already belong to God. So if an Israelite became so desperate that in addition to selling his property he had to sell himself he was to be treated as a hired hand not as a common slave. And he was not to serve any longer than six years. We saw that back in the book of Exodus chapter 21. Not any longer than six years. That was the limit for a Hebrew to serve as a slave. And if the year of Jubilee occurred, 
before the six years expired, he was to be released earlier on that year of Jubilee. See, Hebrew servants were to be treated with dignity, not like slave labor. That's because God purchased their redemption and they were his covenant people. Look at verse 44. And as for your male and female slaves whom you have from the nations that are around you, from them you may buy male and female slaves. Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall become your property. And you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them as a possession. They shall be your permanent slaves. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. Gentile slaves were slaves for life and actually could even be inherited as property. Now, that may, that may sound kind of mean and that may trouble some of you, but we have to remember something. We, we have to remember that God is more concerned about a person's eternal soul than their temporary existence here on earth. See, a Gentile outside of Palestine would drown in a sea of idolatry. A Gentile outside the, outside the area of Palestine with no connection to Israel at all would likely live out their life in pagan idolatry and die and be lost for eternity. But a Gentile slave in Israel although a slave you know, is not the greatest thing in the world to be. But listen to me. A Gentile slave in Israel could be circumcised and brought into the covenant of God. And although he would live his life as a slave, when he died, he'd go to heaven. So it seems cruel, perhaps, at first glance. But think about it. Look at verse 47. Now if a sojourner or stranger close to you becomes rich and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you or to a member of the stranger's family after he is sold he may be redeemed again one of his brothers may redeem him or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him or anyone who is near of kin to him in his family may redeem him or if he is able he may redeem himself thus he shall reckon with him who bought him the price of his release shall be according to the number of years from the year that he was sold to him until the year of jubilee it shall be according to the time of a hired servant for him if there are still many years remaining According to them he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money with, with which he was bought. And if there remain but a few years until the year of Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him, and according to his years he shall repay him the price of his redemption. He shall be with him as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not rule with rigor over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years... Then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. For the children of Israel are my servants. They are servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. A Hebrew who because of poverty became a slave of a foreigner was to be purchased by a relative. Get him out of that spot, God says. But if there was no relative that was willing, or if there was no relative that was able to do that, then he and his family 
were to be released in the year of Jubilee. It wasn't to be a permanent setup. Let's go into chapter 26. We're going to look at the promise of blessing for obedience and the promise of punishment for disobedience for the nation Israel. And boy, we can learn some lessons from this today. For today, look at verse 1. You shall not make idols for yourselves. Neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves. Nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Think back and remember the Ten Commandments. And remember that the first part of the Ten Commandments concerned what? They concerned man's relationship with God. Don't make any graven images, God said. Don't bow down to any other gods. Don't have any other gods besides me. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, they all pertain to man's relationship with God. The three commands here in these first two verses of Leviticus chapter 26. Make no idols. Reverence the sanctuary of God. And keep the Sabbath days. They sum up those first few commandments of the Ten Commandments. And they also must be kept. And they have to be honored. If Israel is to remain in the promised land and be blessed by God. So he begins this chapter the same way the Ten Commandments began. This is what you want. This is what I want you to do uh, for me, Israel. Look at verse 3. God says, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. I will give peace in the land. And you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. The nation Israel would live in peace and prosper if they kept God's commands. Well, they didn't obey, so they suffered. And they still aren't obeying. Therefore, there's no secure peace for them over there. And that's why. It's because they're out of God's will. God wants to bless us. But He can't if we don't obey Him. And Israel will not be blessed the way God intended for them to be blessed until they repent, submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and admit that He is their Messiah and their Savior. That's when the blessings will be poured out from God onto that land, onto that nation. Look at verse 7. Promises for blessing. That's what this is about. Promises for obedience, I should say. Verse 7. You you will chase your enemies, God says, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. God promised tremendous victories over their enemies if they obeyed Him. And you know, for a while, they did that. And this came to pass, just exactly as God said. Whenever Israel repented of their sins, if they fell into idolatry or something and they repented of their sins and returned to God, God would give them tremendous victories over their enemies. 
Oh, you can read about that in the book of Judges. Why don't you go ahead and start reading that? Because before long, we'll be in that book, studying it verse by verse. But it's, it's, it contains illustration after illustrations of, of this truth. That they had tremendous victory by the power of God over their enemies for walking in obedience to God. He took care of them. Look at verse 9. For I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. More food than what you know what to do with, God says, if you only obey me. Not just a lot of food, but a lot of people. And you know, some people may say, well, that's a curse, isn't it? N no, not at all. Lots of people, a big population, is a sign of God's blessing, not of God's curse. You know, unlike some today, God doesn't think a population explosion is a bad thing. You know, a population explosion uh, is not the problem. It's, it really isn't. Uh, disobeying God is the problem. Uh, if a nation obeys God, he will bless their food supply. And they'll be able to feed however many children God gives them. And as far as living in harmony with one another, listen, if you're walking with the Lord, if a nation is walking with the Lord, everything will go smoothly. And there will be harmony. And there will be food in abundance. So it's not the population explosion that's a problem. It's rebellion against God that's the problem. Look at verse 11. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Look at the tremendous blessings for walking in obedience to God. One thing after another, God promises them. Oh, he wants to bless us today. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to enjoy life. And that can only happen when we walk in obedience to Him. But He says here in verses 11 and 12, He's talking about the presence of the tabernacle. And the presence of the tabernacle, the holy sanctuary, is a sign of God's presence. And it's a sign of God's blessing. And that's what He's talking about here. If they keep the law, God is not going to despise them. That's what he says. You know, God wants to have fellowship with us. And that always results in blessing every time. But he must separate himself if we continue in unconfessed sin. That's why somebody who says, well, you know, I'm enjoying great fellowship with God. Yeah, but you're living in sin. Yeah, yeah, I know I am, but I'm still enjoying fellowship with God because, you know, it doesn't matter. That person is lying. God will separate himself from us. He will, in effect, remove his tabernacle from our lives if we walk in unconfessed sin, if we don't repent of our sins. First John 1 John six says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Yet we, we can't have fellowship with God and we do not have fellowship with God if we're living in sin. He removes his tabernacle. He removes his presence. And that, and that removes our joy because we were created to have fellowship with God. And this is one thing he promises Israel. Have a good time together. I'm going to remain among you. And we will be blessed together if you only walk with me. Look at verse 13. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. How would Israel know that God will bless? 
He has promised them tremendous blessings for obedience, hasn't he? Well, how does Israel know for sure that God is a God that really wants to bless them? He reminds them of something right here in verse 13. I am the Lord your God who brought you out out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. What's he saying? He's saying, Israel, you want to know? You want to know for sure that I will bless? Well, listen. Take a look at my track record. God had a track record of blessing them, starting with their deliverance from Egypt. This reminder of God's past goodness should serve as a driving force for holiness in their life right now. Because they've already experienced the blessing of God when they were submitting to him and they followed him in the land of Egypt he got them out of that place because they were so this reminder of God's past goodness and his past Faithfulness to bless his obedient people should serve as a driving force for holiness as well. So that's something to keep in mind. You need a motivation for being holy, for walking with the Lord. Look at God's track record of blessing those who are holy. Verse 14 If you do not obey me, and do not observe all these commandments and if you despise my statutes or if your soul abhors my judgment so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant stop there for a second because now we're going to look at the other side of the coin God already listed a number of tremendous blessings for their obedience and for their holiness and now we look at the flip side punishments for breaking his commands, for breaking the covenant that they made with him. And you know, that's a serious issue. Breaking any blood covenant meant death for the violator. So you can imagine the seriousness of breaking a blood covenant with Almighty God. Well, I'll tell you, there are some serious consequences for any nation or person who despises God's law and as a result disobeys it verse 16 says I also will do this to you I will even appoint terror over you wasting disease and fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart and you shall sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it I will set my face against you and you shall be defeated by your enemies those who hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when no one pursues you. God says, if you turn away from me, some bad things are going to happen. If you turn away from me, and the first degree of punishment that you'll face is agony. Agony and stress from illness, from famine, and from defeat. God says, if you disobey, you're going to suffer physically and mentally. And you know, I am absolutely convinced that that's the way it is even today. Oh, it is. The first degree in the chastisement of Almighty God in which He punishes His children, chastises, disciplines His children, agony. It's agony and it's stress and it's defeat. And you know, I'm convinced that many believers who have mental problems are suffering because they're not sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ. They're holding back on them. And God is trying to get their attention. If that doesn't work, look at verse 18. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze and your strength shall be spent in vain 
for your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. God says, if the first degree of punishment doesn't bring you to your senses, cause you to repent, I'll press you harder. I'll send drought. I'll send crop failure. Well, this is, this is an especially uh, severe judgment. In an in a agrarian society like Israel was. In other words, God says this. He says, the second degree of punishment is going to hit you right in the pocketbook. First it was stress. First it was agony. First it was illness and defeat. But that didn't get you to repent. You were feeling bad because of your sin, but that didn't get you to repent. So now I'm going to hit you right in the pocketbook. Maybe that'll work. But if not, then look at verse 21. Then, if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number and your highways shall be desolate. God says, if you still do not repent, I'll send the third level of punishment. Wild animals. Sending wild animals. And they're going to cause desolation. That doesn't work. Look at verse 23. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me. Then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins, and I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of your enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread, Ten women shall bake bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. Well, here you have the fourth degree of punishment. If they don't repent after the first three forms of chastisement, then God will bring number four. What is it? Disease and enemy oppression disease would strike them from inside and the enemy would strike them from outside. They'd get it from both ends. You know, if we today who name the name of Christ call ourselves Christians, if we today mess with sin, we open ourselves up to the oppression of our enemy as well. Who's our enemy? The devil. We give him a foothold when we disobey God. That opens the door for him. It sets out the welcome mat for him to come in and oppress us. You know, our enemies may differ, but the principles of God's punishment for his moral failure remain the same. And we can learn lessons from this. I'm telling you, we better learn lessons or we're going to have an awful miserable existence and our enemies are going are to push us around and beat us up and slap us up until we're wasted. All because God lets down his guard when his children are disobedient. Verse 27. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. Well, the fifth degree of punishment for disobedience would be severe famine. 
And it would be so bad, so bad that parents would do the unthinkable. They'd eat their own children and say, impossible. Can't imagine doing that. My friends, this literally happened. Check it out. Second Kings chapter 6 and Lamentations chapter 2 and chapter 4. Disobedience to the continual rebukes of God. Indifference to the continual rebukes of God brings about unthinkable misery. Misery. And will cause you, will result in you doing things that you would never imagine that you could possibly do. Verse 32. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. God says, if you still do not repent, I'll send the sixth degree of punishment. What's that? Dispersion. Here God says, your land will be so desolate that even the occupying forces will be afraid to be there. And that happened too. Jeremiah chapter 18 and Jeremiah chapter 19. God said he'd draw out a sword and chase them from their land. And that's exactly what he did. And the sword of the Lord was the Babylonian kingdom. Look at verse 34. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. God is speaking prophetic history here. Remember the command to give the land a rest one year out of every seven years? Well, they didn't. So he's speaking prophetic history here. The Israelites did not give the land its Sabbath rest for 490 years. They disobeyed that command. You know what that means? Figure it out. That means they missed seven, the land missed 70 Sabbath years of rest. And Israel must have thought, I'm sure, well, I guess God you know, didn't really mean what he commanded because he's letting us get away with it. I mean, we've been doing it for 490 years and he hasn't punished us yet. He must be letting us get away with it. Changed his mind, huh? Wrong. Don't ever mistake God's patience with sinners for indifference to sin because He's not indifferent. I'll tell you something. The fact that God will punish sin is precisely why He's sometimes long-suffering with sinners. It's because it's what Peter said in the New Testament. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. God sent Israel into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. As a result, he made sure that the land got paid back for those 70 missed Sabbath years of rest. Look at verse 36. And as for those of you who are left, I will send faintness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies. The sound of a shaken leaf shall cause them to flee. They shall flee as though fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when no one is pursuing. They shall stumble over one another, as it were before a sword, when no one even pursues, and you shall have no power to stand before your enemies. You shall perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And those of you who are left shall waste away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. Also in their fathers' iniquities, which are with them, they shall waste away. This is an amazing prophetic picture of what has happened since Israel was exiled into Babylon. Babylon. Uh, this is exactly what happened. 
they have been scattered and persecuted throughout the world just as God said oftentimes living in terror verse 40 but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they also have walked contrary to me if they confess these things and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt verse 42 says then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham I will remember I will remember the land if Israel obeys God they can stay in their land that's what, he, that's what the first part of this chapter was about if they disobey God's going to boot them right out of there. If they repent, he'll bring them back. Today, Israel is guilty of rejecting their Messiah. And for 2,000 years, they've been reaping the consequences of that sin. But you know, one day, the Bible says they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Remember how Jesus' side was pierced with that sword? One day the Bible says they will look on him whom they have pierced. They will look on him. They will look on the one they have crucified. And they will repent. Because they're going to recognize that he was their Messiah. And when they do, God's going to restore them to their land. Just like he says right here. Why does God forgive and restore them? Because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He keeps his promises. And their blessing and their being able to stay in that land was a conditional promises. A conditional promise. If you obey me, God says, then you will enjoy this land. Someday they will when they once again obey him by receiving Jesus. Verse 43. The land also shall be left empty by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. What a good God he is. Israel has rejected their God. Yes, they have. Now, you know, they can deny that if they want to, but the fact of the matter is Jesus is their Messiah. And Jesus said, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. And Jesus claimed to be God. And he accepted the worship that only God should accept. So Israel has rejected their God but their unfaithfulness isn't the issue and their faithfulness isn't the issue God's faithfulness is the issue they've rejected their God but he's not through with them he'll never be through with them his covenant with them is an everlasting covenant dating all the way back to Abraham and he's not through with them Oh, he's punishing them because they have rejected him and they are in rebellion against him but he hasn't tossed them aside forever not like some people think he has he keeps his promises verse 45 but for their sake I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God I am the Lord These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Because of God's covenant with their fathers, he's going to return to them and uh, they will be returning to the land. And God's going to restore all that he has promised to them. 
and bless them. And they will experience tremendous blessing in the future, in the millennium, when they receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, as their Lord, and as their Messiah. And He comes to rule and reign and set up His kingdom in Jerusalem. Good times are coming because they are God's people. Let's go into chapter 27. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord according to your valuation, stop there for a second, if a person was vowed to the Lord, if he was, in other words, dedicated to the Lord, that dedicated person needed to be redeemed, needed to be bought back. And he had to be bought back according to the value placed on him by the law of Moses. And we're going to look at the different values placed on different people according to their ages and their sex. Let's look at it beginning in verse 3. If your valuation is of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If it is a female then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. A person who was dedicated by a vow to God uh, was not to be offered as a sacrifice, nor was he to spend his life serving in the tabernacle. He was to be redeemed. In other words, somebody was to pay, pay to have him released from his vow. And the redemption price varied according to the age and the sex of the person. The labor value was apparently the the standard that was used. And a man, as we see in these verses, between the ages of 20 and 60, you know, that's the prime of life. And he could do a lot of work. So he had a high redemption price. Now, a woman's labor value was less. Not because she was less value in God's eyes, believe me, uh, but because of the type of labor needed in that society. She just wasn't able to be as productive as a man. So uh, she was not worth as much when it came to a redemption price. Look at verse 5. And if from 5 years old up to 20 years old, then your valuation for a male shall be 20 shekels, and for a female 10 shekels. And if from a month old up to 5 years old, then your valuation for a male shall be 5 shekels of silver, and for a female your valuation shall be 3 shekels of silver. And if from sixty years old and above, if it is a male, then your valuation shall be fifteen shekels, and for a female, ten shekels. But, look at verse 8. If he is too poor to pay your valuation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall set a value for him, according to the ability of him who vowed. The priest shall value him. The person's value was determined on the basis of his ability to work, right? We have already seen that. And remember, though, these vows were voluntarily. They were voluntarily made. Now, a person was to dedicate himself by his own free will. God was not forcing anybody to dedicate themselves or forcing anybody to dedicate somebody else. And God would not exclude anyone from this privilege either. Not because of poverty. Not because they were too poor. As a result, if a person didn't have much, a priest could set a fair price according to the person's ability to pay. Verse 10, verse 9. If it is an animal that men may bring as an offering to the Lord, all that anyone gives to the Lord shall be holy. He shall not substitute it or exchange it, good for bad or bad for good. And if he at all exchanges animal for animal, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. God says if you vow an animal, don't have second thoughts. That is, don't substitute it. You know, it's important for us to understand that if we make a vow to to God, if we make a vow to give or do something to God, He holds us to it. Don't exchange it. Don't change it. And don't go back on it. Verse 11. 
if it is an unclean animal which they do not offer as a sacrifice to the Lord, then he shall present the animal before the priest, and the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad. As you, the priest, value it, so it shall be. But if he wants at all to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth to your valuation. An unclean animal couldn't be sacrificed to God. God didn't want it. But it could be dedicated to God with a vow. The priest was to set the redemption price, and the owner was to pay it, plus 20%. Perhaps this was a penalty for offering an unclean beast to God. I don't know, but God didn't want it offered to him as a sacrifice because it was unclean, which was a picture of sin. You know, if the animal was an unclean animal, one that could not be eaten, well, he fell into that category of an unclean beast. And that was a sign of sin. That pointed to sin. And, of course, God will not stand in the presence of of a sinner and he will not receive a sinner until that sinner has repented and had his sins washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ look at verse 14 and when a man dedicates his house to be holy to the Lord then the priest shall set a value for it whether it is good or bad as the priest values it so it shall stand If he who dedicated it wants to redeem his house, then he must add one-fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it shall be his. A person could vow their home to God. They could dedicate their home to God. Well, what would a priest do with with a house? You know, what would what would a home how would a home benefit the sanctuary of God? Well it wouldn't. So it was probably sold and the money used in service of the Lord, in service of the tabernacle. But like in the case of an unclean animal, the owner could redeem it for its valuation plus 20% if he wanted it back. Look at verse 16. If a man dedicates to the Lord part of a field of his possession, then your valuation shall be according to the seed for it. A homer of barley seed shall be valued at fifty shekels of silver. If he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee, according to your valuation, it shall stand. But if he dedicates his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon to him the money due according to the years that remain till the year of Jubilee, and it shall be deducted from your valuation. And if he who dedicates the field ever wishes to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it shall belong to him. But if he does not want to redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed any more. But the field, when it is released in the year of Jubilee, shall be holy to the Lord as a devoted field. It shall be the possession of the priest. And if a man dedicates to the Lord a field which he has bought, which is not the field of his possession. Then the priest shall reckon to him the worth of your valuation up to the year of Jubilee, and he shall give your holy val- your valuation on that day as a holy offering to the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, the field shall return to him from whom it was bought to the one who owned the land as a possession, and all your valuations shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary, twenty giras, to the shekel well there's a lot of words there to sum it up for you let me me just say this land could be dedicated to God and its valuation was based on its productivity and in relation to the year of Jubilee in order to redeem that land the owner had to pay its valuation price plus 20% if it wasn't redeemed by the year of Jubilee, the property became the permanent property of the priest. And, I mean, as you can see, it's a very complicated law. Verse 26. But the firstborn of the animals, which should be the Lord's firstborn, no man shall dedicate, whether it is an ox or a sheep, 
it is the Lord's. And if it is an unclean animal, then he shall redeem it according to your valuation and shall add one-fifth to it. Or if it is not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to your valuation. Firstborn animals already belong to God and couldn't therefore be dedicated to him with a vow. I mean, that seems obvious, doesn't it? I mean, I've got a, I've got a pickup truck, a Chevy pickup truck, and, and you can't put a bow on it. And, wrap it up and say, Mike, here's your birthday present. It's already mine. And that's what God is, is saying here. It's all, the firstborn animals already belong to me. Don't, don't try dedicating them to me. Look at verse 28. Nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. No person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Now, maybe that verse woke you up a little bit. Let me tell you this. These two verses deal with national, not individual vows. If, for example... the nation Israel goes out to war and the enemy or the spoils of war were dedicated to the Lord during a battle those people or those things could not be redeemed the captives could not be kept as slaves under any circumstances and their possessions could not be taken home and put in a safety deposit box either for the Israelites. They were irrevocably given to God. They must be destroyed. Verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit tree, fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, of whatever passes under his rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed." Tithes of produce could not be redeemed. Excuse me, they could be redeemed. They could be redeemed by paying the value plus 20%. But tithes of animals, they couldn't be redeemed. The tithe belonged to God and could not be pledged in a vow. It was already His. Well, this ends our study in the book of Numbers or in the book of Leviticus and let me finish by reading verse 34 these are the commandments which the Lord commanded